treatment optimization for tick disorders, the selection of a particular treatment approach has to be carefully assessed for each individual case, taking into account a number of factors, tick symptom severity, the level of functional impairment, severity of comorbid medical and psychiatric conditions, the child's age at presentation, the duration of illness, adequacy and efficacy of other treatment strategies, tolerability of single combined treatments, and when establishing the treatment hierarchy, one should begin with the most impairing condition, and that may not be the tick. Treatment optimization for tick disorders, if the comorbid disorder has a more significant impact on overall quality of life than the tick symptoms. The treatment of comorbid psychiatric conditions such as ADHD, OCD, anxiety disorders, or mood disorders may in fact take precedence once baseline characteristics of tick severity and functional impairment have been established, a collaborative approach towards choosing the appropriate treatment modality needs to be undertaken with the patient and family to determine the necessity and intensity of intervention needed. Remember that many patients with tick disorders don't need any treatment at all. Reassurance is sufficient. Behavior therapy treatment optimization. A standard course of behavior therapy is usually between 7 to 14 sessions. That being said, the required number of sessions will vary depending on number of bothersome ticks and the patient's parent's ability to master and implement the behavioral strategies. Compliance with out-of-session homework and between-session practice assignments, including practicing behavioral strategies, making modifications to school, and practicing talking about ticks. These are all very important aspects of treatment that can impact therapeutic outcome and should be emphasized to patients and their families early during treatment. Pharmacotherapy. Pharmacologic treatment for tick disorders should be considered only when behavioral interventions fail or aren't available. That is a lack of access. You can't find a therapist who's trained in treating ticks, patient factors such as cognitions, willingness to participate, or when patients exhibit severe violent ticks that need treatment. Before starting treatment with medication, clinicians need to explain the purpose set a realistic goal to reduce the severity and frequency of ticks to the extent that they no longer bother the patient or cause significant problems. The selection of a particular pharmacologic treatment for ticks requires a cautious analysis of the risk benefits, including consideration of medication side effect profile, potential interactions with concomitant medications, and comorbidity. Additional factors have to be considered. Those are cost, the insurance coverage, the ease of administration, leveraging side effects such as sedation or areas where you can treat co-occurring problems using clonidine or guanfacine for ticks with comorbid ADHD, taking advantage of sedating side effects to administer at nighttime for youth who have trouble falling asleep using topiramate for youth with comorbid migraine, excessive sweating, or obesity. These are all critical considerations. The patient age, weight, metabolic factors, and medical comorbidity, liver, kidney, or other concurrent medical disease also are critically important. Adverse effects often lead to discontinuation of treatment or treatment adherence which can be poor, limiting the opportunity to reach optimal dose and response. And here is where the doctor-patient relationship is so critical, because if your patient in the family isn't telling you about side effects or concerns and they're not taking the medication regularly, that can impact response or lack thereof. Asking patients about common and rare but serious adverse effects at each follow-up assessment provides an opportunity to monitor the issue. And as a rule, medicines are started on a low dose with gradual titration until an effective dose is reached. 
Adjustments in medication dosing must also take into account the waxing and waning nature of ticks so that inadvertent escalation of medication dosage doesn't occur unless truly warranted. Considerable harm happens when a medicine is increased too rapidly because there's concern that there's not enough benefit. All too often, I've seen more good medicines ruined by escalating the dose too rapidly. In children and adolescents, you can't go wrong if you start low, go slow, possibly end up high, but give the child adolescent time to become tolerant to the medicine. Physicians should discuss weaning patients off medicines once symptoms subside so that ticks are no longer disruptive. Discontinuing the medicine. There are many guidelines for the management of tick disorders over the short term. The problem is recommendations for long-term medication management are lacking. Current guidance suggests that dose reduction should be considered on an annual basis if ticks are stable. And when considering a discontinuation trial, efforts should be made to optimize chances of success by pairing the trial with a period with low tick-inducing social environmental factors, minimal life stressors, and regular and adequate amounts of sleep. Encouraging the patient to focus on the importance of their resilience and the strength rather than on ticks being a defining factor of their identity is also incredibly helpful for decreasing the salience of residual and lingering ticks. So we're empowering our patients, the children, and of course, their parents. Treatment resistance. A number of patients respond only partially to treatment and will continue to experience some degree of tick-related impairment and distress. For those patients who fail to respond to initial treatment, it's critical to conduct a thorough assessment and reassessment, solicit feedback from the youth and their families to identify issues which may be preventing treatment response and determine whether any aspects of treatment should be re-emphasized, revisited, should the diagnoses be revisited, are they accurate, are they complete. Children who are unable to engage with HRT or CBIT can benefit from alternative aspects of behavioral therapy, in particularly utilizing function-based assessment and intervention related to triggers and consequences for ticks may provide additional therapeutic benefits. Clinicians also need to focus on areas that can improve overall quality of life, even if they don't directly decrease tick frequency or impact tick severity as well as patient adherence to behavioral intervention and compliance with medicine. You can have the best medicine in the world, but if your patient isn't taking the medicine, it's not going to help. And similarly with a behavioral intervention, if your patient isn't motivated or the family isn't motivated to do the behavioral interventions, they can't work if they're not attempted. Key points. Treatment of comorbid psychiatric conditions such as ADHD, OCD, non-OCD anxiety, mood disorders, not uncommonly take precedence in treatment of tick disorders, especially if the comorbid disorder has a more significant impact on overall quality of life than the tick symptoms. Adjustments in medication dosing must take the waxing and waning nature of ticks into consideration to avoid unnecessary escalation of medication dosage, especially if it's not warranted. And there's very limited data regarding long-term treatment of tick disorders with current guidelines recommending that dose reduction be considered on an annual basis if the ticks are stable.